we're going to talk about the computer software unit, which is mainly about the operating system and some of the different utility programs it has. So first of all, we've got the operating system. Should hopefully remember from standard grade that there are several different operations it controls in the computer system and that it controls input and output devices, it controls security, it's responsible for file management and memory management and several other important features as well. And it's constantly running when the computer system's turned on until it's turned off. And we're going to learn about something that's jobs to load the rest of the operating system when it starts up as well. And that's called the bootstrap loader. And there is a small piece of the operating system stored in read-only memory that when the power's turned on the computer its instruction is to find where the operating system's uh, stored on disk and to load it up and there's two different types of operating system we could have you should try and think about what the advantages are for having an operating system that's stored in ROM rather than disk based that could be edited and a disk based one is more open to attack from viruses or it could be altered Whereas if it's in read-only memory, then it cannot be edited at all, so viruses would not be able to change that part. This is a diagram that you're going to have to understand the different parts. And these are the layers in a single user operating system. And you need to be able to describe the function of each layer, usually with a task like transferring a file from a memory card and a camera or something. So from the outside, we have the command language interpreter. The file management system, memory management system, which are two functions you should hopefully remember from uh, the operating system from standard grade, the input output layer, and the kernel input output management. And you've got the kernel there that sits at the centre of everything, controlling all the processes, making sure that uh, any in uh, interrupts are handled. And here is just a wee bit about each of the layers of the single user operating system. We'll go into this in more detail further on, but it's an area that's worth spending a lot of time reading because it's an easily four mark question in the prelim and in your final exam. Okay, on to utility programs now. So utility programs are programs which do an everyday task and you need to know quite a few of them and be able to describe what they do or if you were given a description of utility program you'd need to be able to name it as well. So it's a bit like Batman's utility belt. <laughs> the operating system has utility programs to do almost everything. So, if you want to do some research here, I'll talk over these all in a second. It may be in your interest to go and read about them if you don't know any of them, but this is a list of seven or so uh, utility programs that may come up in the exam, and you may have to describe these. So, virus checker, this should be quite straightforward, it simply checks, checks memory and we'll go and talk about actual techniques it uses to find viruses shortly and it basically is checking to see if the computer has any viruses. Installer uninstaller should be quite straightforward as well, installs programs, uninstalls programs. Disk editor will allow you to go in and physically edit the contents of a hard disk, really specific editing though almost down to the specific memory locations that need to be edited, maybe if there's a, an error on the disk or something. Printer drivers need to be installed so that the computer system and any peripheral, in fact not just printer drivers, any driver software so that they can communicate between them similar to an interface and that would allow you to send files to be printed by the printer and the printer would recognise <coughs> the characters and so on that were sent. Defragmenter seems to be one that they ask about a lot in the exam and if you think about <coughs> when a grenade blows up it all fragments and all the pieces are scattered everywhere and a similar thing happens to when files are saved over a long period of time in a computer system files that are linked together so images programs and so on they all become fragmented and the file locations aren't contiguous in a computer system and defragmenting will improve the performance of a computer system because it reorders all your files together so that when it's loading up a program 
all of the separate pieces of the files and the different memory locations are all stored together so it takes less time to find and load them. We have email and web filters which should be straightforward. You can set up filters so that um, emails you don't want to receive get filtered straight into your um, trash bin or into your um, any folder you want in fact as well. You can set up filters to filter in emails from a certain person, a certain address or containing certain words and similarly if you think about the school's web filtering provided by the web server certain pages uh, aren't allowed through because they maybe contain words that are the, the filtering programs filtered out as well as having loads of domain names like youtube, facebook.com are filtered out. Backup hope you all know what that is. That allows you to create a backup strategy and you could link this back to the networks there and ask why it's better or easier sorry, to set up in a client server network than it is in peer-to-peer. -peer. And it just allows you to create a backup strategy for automatic backups. And Emulator allows your computer system to run software from different computer systems by pretending that it is the operating system for another device. Another piece of research you need to do, and this comes up in a few of the different topics, is different standard file formats. Now you should remember out of these six listed here which are text file formats and standard text file formats and those are TXT, RTF and the one that's missing ASCII, A-S-C-I-I. -I. Well similarly this year you need to know a little bit about GIFs, JPEGs and TIFFs. First of all need to know what they stand for, so GIF is a Graphics Interchange Format, JPEG is Joint Photographic Experts Group, and TIFF is Tagged Image File Format. Now you need to know a couple of facts about each of them, so how many colours they represent, uh, what type of compression technique they use, and any other facts about them, in particular TIFF has one wee extra piece of information that they want you to know about it. So this is what you need to know about graphic standard file formats. And that is this, that GIFs are 8-bit, generally used on the internet, and they use lossless compression. JPEGs use lossy compression. They allow up to 24-bit true colour uh, images. And because they're lossy, you can have smaller file sizes than an equivalent GIF. And TIFF is a bit different as well. Uh, they would say that it can be an uncompressed format and that is raw and it just stores everything. But it does have different compressions. Can it store up to true colour and also it's capable of storing a transparent colour as well. So if you've ever used any um, more advanced image editing software you'll see there's a transparent colour can be used in images and it lets the colour from behind uh, appear through. Okay, an important task that you should do is to find hardware and software to do each of the following tasks. So the first one is produ production of a multimedia catalogue, so what hardware and software do you need for that, and the same again, to set up a LAN in a school and to develop a school website. So if you want to do that research task, if you pause the video here and come back and look and see if you found the same programmes as I have listed here. So for producing a multimedia catalogue we would use Hyper Studio or Macromedia Director which are both programs that allow you to create multimedia catalogues using images, uh, sound clips, movie clips etc. What software for setting up LAN in schools? Well there's a couple of different ones we could use for different tasks. Windows Server from Microsoft allows us to create a structure of client server networks and FileMaker Pro is an advanced databases application which allows you to create the um, file structures that require the hierarchical file structure that you would get in our RM shared area for instance. And for developing a school website there's tons of different software you could choose a couple here. Front page from Microsoft or Dreamweaver are both uh, web design um, applications to allow you to create websites. Okay, next, you need to have a think about the different compatibil compatibility issues that software could encounter when you try and run it or try even installing it on a computer system. And 
a couple of different ones are memory requirements. Do you have enough RAM memory to even allow your program to run once it's been installed? So thinking of older computer systems may have a limited amount of RAM and newer programs will all require larger amounts of RAM. Storage requirements, do you even have enough backend storage to install your program in the first place? Operating system compatibility, do you have the right operating system installed? Do you have an older operating system? For instance, older games that worked on Windows 98 no longer work unless you have some form of emulator on newer operating systems. And processor speed, does your processor have the minimum speed required? Now there's several others here and all this information is usually contained in a technical guide uh, that you would get with the program. Viruses is a small unit but it covers quite a lot in this final topic. So there's three different types of virus. First of all you get a general virus which causes damage to a computer system and like viruses for us humans they're usually spread with contact so if you bring home infected floppy disks, infected USBs, infected CDs you download them because you're downloading things from peer-to-peer -peer sh file sharing websites or from games websites and so on worms are different they don't have to be attached onto a file as a virus does or downloaded these are capable of copying themselves and spreading themselves between different computers and you would notice a spike in your computer's memory as it starts to replicate itself uh, and these are more difficult because they don't have to be coming into your computer system through infected disks and downloads and so on and the third type is a trojan horse and basically we, nowadays we get them all combined together into malware files that they do everything and these Trojan horses, if you're familiar with your history you'll know that a Trojan horse was supposedly a present but inside it was tons and tons of soldiers and this Trojan horse in a computer system uh, is named after that because it pretends to be a different type of file or a keylogger. Uh, I've had one before in fact that um, pretended to be the bank login screen for my bank obviously and it wasn't until I noticed it was looked slightly different it was asking me for more information than usual that I realised that I had a Trojan horse and, and it was logging the keys I was pressing. Okay, viruses, you need to know some of the virus actions that they carry out uh, once you have become infected or once your computer system has been infected so replication it's quite simple and straightforward and the virus makes copies of itself camouflage is one of the virus actions it uses to disguise itself and if you think of programs you've written in higher you'll have all this code that makes your program work which would be easy to spot if it was a virus if it was purely virus code so what camouflage does is it contains code that's just useless, it's just nonsense code, or even it could do something completely and utterly unbecoming of a virus to try and hide this dangerous code uh, within it. Watching is when a virus uh, will specifically wait for actions, for instance a time bomb virus that will sit dormant on a computer system waiting for a specific time or a specific event to appear for instance that last virus I've seen about the Trojan horse obviously had waited until I had logged into the bank uh, before it had logged up the keylogger screen. Um, delivery is the method it uses to enter your computer system so it could be from downloading from torrent websites, it could be attached itself onto a file that you've executed and inadvertently restarted the virus and this is another good area to do a bit of reading on because the exam look for good descriptions here. So how do computer systems detect viruses then? Well there's a few different ones and these are here. So we've got checksum, virus signature, heuristic detection and memory resident monitoring. So if you want to do a wee bit of your own research you could pause it here and then I'll tell you about them. So checksum is quite similar to the check digit you may have learned about in standard grade and that is a calculation that they would do on a, an application file and it will store the result it gets for that calculation now later on the virus checker will carry out that same calculation on that file 
and if the sum it calculates is different then it will flag that up to you as possibly being a virus. Now it's a virus checker, it doesn't delete it, it only tells you about them. Virus signature, and none of these are going to appear in the correct order, virus signature is where it searches through files for characteristic codes that it knows to be malicious. Now this is why you need to make sure your uh, virus definitions are up to date because all the time new viruses are coming out. If your definitions aren't up to date then your program will not be detecting the latest malicious code. So for the virus signature it basically works a bit like spell checker and it's got a dictionary of all of these dangerous actions and dangerous pieces of code that it looks for and if it finds these again it flags it up. Heuristics, heuristic detection, are rules of thumb that would say what does a virus do? For instance, if you seed something that was yellow and it quacked, you would say it's a duck. And that is you using heuristics to decide which something is or what something is. And it's the same idea here, if a file is trying to stay in memory after it's been executed, if it's trying to access file locations it, it shouldn't be, if it's trying to stay in memory after it's been used and so on. These are all heuristics who'd say, okay, it's behaving like a virus, so the chances are it may be a virus, it doesn't mean it has to be, but it's an alarm bell that's set off with your virus checker and it tells you about it. Memory resident monitoring is a bit like a bodyguard on your RAM memory in that it checks if programs aren't trying to stay in main memory after they've been closed or they're trying to access different file locations and so on that they shouldn't be. Again, this is another important area to go and spend a bit of time reading over to really understand the different detection techniques.